Good evening. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you all at this very first event of the new season in the green space. Thank you for being here. I'm Ed Yim. I'm the Chief Content Officer of WQXR. And we're so excited to have Carlos and Seth and Janae here tonight and all of you. Um, this is a place where the amazing talents of WNYC, WQXR, and the green space come together. It's where journalism and current issues and culture and media collide. That's the way we like to think about it. So uh, tonight you're gonna hear the music part of it. And I just wanted to first thank, um, how many of you are members of, of New York Public Radio or of the green space? Thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member and you'd like to get our newsletters and so on, please go to the green space website and sign up and we'll let you know what's going on. So thank you for your support and thank you to Steinway as always for providing this beautiful piano that we use often and fruitfully. Um, the rest of this fall, um, just so you'll come back, uh, the amazing John Baptiste will be here on October 16th for a listening party and performance. That'll be very cool. Um, the Gateways Music Festival will be here on October 21st uh, featuring their brass collective. If you don't know what the Gateways Music Festival is, it is a festival of um, black American musicians who come together frequently to play together um, and they do amazing programs and they're gonna be at Carnegie later this fall too. And then, oh yeah, this one. Um, the drag performer RuPaul's Drag Race uh, uh, contestant, violinist, yes, violinist, Thorgy Thor is returning for a series in the green space this year where she will be combining music with comedy, with cocktails, with all sorts of things. And her first show will be a holiday variety show in December. They're really fun, so don't miss that. Um, go to thegreenspace.org for tickets and more information. Uh, housekeeping, please silence your cell phones if you and, and double check that you have done that because we are going out to the world with this live stream and you know the video will be available later for people too so we don't want them to have uh, cell phones go off or for any of you. Um, okay, so tonight um, the composer Carlos Simon has released two new albums this fall. Um, the first one is called Together and he has uh, collected an amazing group of collaborators and tonight we have from that amazing group uh, Janae Bridges and Seth Parker Woods. Um, just quickly, um, Carlos, I first met oh, psh, like six, seven years ago when he uh, was a, a, a composer that the American Composers Orchestra commissioned to write a piece called Portrait of a Queen. And I remember sitting in the audience and just, you know that feeling when you're, you're hearing someone that you've never heard of before and like the, the tingle goes up the back of your neck and you're like, oh, this is someone, <laughs> right? That's how I felt about Carlos. And then we later commissioned him again when I was at ACO. Um, he wrote a beautiful piece during the pandemic that we premiered virtually with the Brooklyn Youth Chorus and Anthony Roth Costanzo um, that called Another Rising. And um, he's written an opera for the Washington National Opera. He's just absolutely one of my favorite composers and I've been following him since pretty much the beginning. So I am super delighted that um, his team asked if they could do this record release celebration here. So to tell you a little bit more about what you're gonna hear tonight and to sort of guide us along this evening, I wanna welcome my esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Terrence McKnight, who is the evening host on WQXR and also last year released his first podcast called Every Voice with Terrence McKnight, which uh, talks all about representations of blackness in opera. It's a really fantastic listen. So if you haven't listened to Every Voice with Terrence McKnight, go to Spotify or you know Apple or whatever, wherever you get your podcasts, as they say, and, and take a listen. It's really great. So without further ado, enjoy your evening and welcome to Terrence McKnight. Good evening, everybody. So nice to see all of you here on this Friday evening. Beautiful weather. I'm Terrence McKnight. I'm the evening host on WQXR. And uh, it's a special evening for us. We're here to celebrate a composer, uh, Carlos Simon, 
whose record we've been featuring on our website and playing a lot of his music on air. And tonight we'll get to hear some of that music and meet the composer. Now our friends at NPR say that Carlos is a young composer on the rise with an ear for social justice. So we'll get to hear what that's all about. Carlos grew up in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, and these days his music is being heard in concert halls around the United States and around the world. He composes film. He is currently the composer in residence for the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. 2023, this year, he was nominated for a Grammy for an uh, album called Requiem for the Enslaved. And so tonight we're going to celebrate him and this record called Together. Now on this record, he features some of his great good friends, musical collaborators. And it's a testament to his upbringing and development as a musician and as a composer. His collaborators on this recording are mostly musicians of color. They bring their own histories, talents, and perspectives to this partnership. We're gonna start with one of those collaborators, mezzo-soprano Janae Bridges. Now her career has catapulted in the past few years from her Grammy-winning performance as Queen Nefertiti in the Philip Glass Opera Akhenaten to performances on all of the world's leading opera stages. And I'm a proud, proud to say she's a friend of WQXR. She's been here several times. Y'all doing all right tonight? <laughs> We're gonna bring out Carlos Simon and Janae Bridges. Carlos is gonna sit at the piano. And Janae is gonna sing a song called Prayer from Carlos's record together. Please welcome Janae Bridges, Carlos Simon. <laughs>
Janae Bridges, Carlos Simon. Music by Carlos Simon, poetry by Langston Hughes. The piece is called Prayer. We're live here in the green space celebrating the work of Carlos Simon, in particular his new album called Together. So Carlos is going to join me over here in the chair so we can uh, have a little conversation. Come on, sir. <laughs> I already got a water here, huh? Yeah, this is my glass. All right. Get you a little water. So you come to New York. Oh, I'm going to use this one. <laughs> Welcome to the Green Space, Carlos. Thank you, sir. Gl so glad to have you here. You come here doing Langston Hughes, man. Yeah. Langston Hughes was so, uh, such a part of this city, um, such a part of the Harlem community, such a, uh, you know, man of the world. Why did you choose his poetry? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I love Langston Hughes. I have a, a huge collection of his, his work. You, you got know? that book? I got the book with, yeah. the, with the plays and everything. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think I was in graduate school and I got the book. And, I, you know, I just made a point to read these poems, mm -hmm. you know, sporadic, sporadically, you know, because I wanted, always wanted to set Langston Hughes. Yeah. Because, um, I, I mean, it's, you, list, you read it, and it, it's a blues, it's in, it's in there, the blues, the spirituals. Uh, it sounds, it, it, it feels like um, it, music belongs with the words. And so I've read this poem, Prayer. There's actually another prayer, too. Um, but I read this one, and I was like, absolutely, I have to, I have to set this you know, to music. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, you know, Langston always wanted to be a songwriter. He sure, to sure. Musician. Yeah, you know, um, he, he was actually good friends with Margaret Bonds, yeah. you know, as a pianist, composer. Um, they actually have, they were really close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He brought her to New York. That's right. But we're here to talk about you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we would have been good friends. So there are a lot of, a lot of artists back in the day where I, I think we could have been, like, really good friends. Like Romare Bearden, oh, I think we would have been really good friends. Yeah. Well, you and I, we can be good friends. Right? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got some uh, some friends um, on this record. Uh, we started with Janae, Seth Parker Woods. We brought him in the green space tonight. He's a mm -hmm. cellist. We're going to hear from him. Who else is on this on your uh, record together? Uh, that's Randall Gooseby. Yep. Um, and of course, you mentioned Seth Parker Woods and Janae, and I. We, I went to Chicago and recorded with a string orchestra there. And you know, there are a lot of great musicians. And of course, I knew a lot of um, uh, violinists and cellists and, and the string players in, in, this, in the city, in Chicago. And we actually recorded there with the string orchestra and uh, with Will Lieberman, you know, who is singing Angels in Heaven. This is another hymn. Um, yeah, so that's, it's, it's, it, was a, it was fun. It was, uh, I wanted it to be fun. Um, just to come in the studio and just hang. And then I, I would say like 75% 70 of the time that we, we were in the studio was just kind of hanging. Like 25%, I'm not gonna say, I shouldn't say that, my label's here. <laughs> oh my God, okay. Um, but the rest of the time we, we, we produce an album, so, so it's fine. It's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk a little bit about that. How are, how are records produced this year or how was your work, record produced? Did, did the label come to you and say, man, just do whatever you want to do, or how, yeah, how'd well, they go down? Yeah, well, they produced the last album, Wreck Me and For the Enslaved, and um, they asked me after that, you know, what do you want to do? And I'm just like, you know, as a composer, I, it's a lonely profession. I'm, I'm alone a lot. Um, and I, I just wanted to get into the studio and, and just be with my closest friends and um, you know, just to kind of develop something new. And so... That's what we did, and I, I pitched the idea to them and, and mentioned the artists that I wanted to work with, and they supported it. Mm -hmm. Now, talk about the, the mm, what can I say, writing for you know, uh, a, a group of soloists, like a, a cellist or a, a singer, and, and um, yourself as a pianist. What's the, the difference or how satisfying is that compared to writing for orchestra? Because you do mm -hmm. a good amount of that these days too. What's that like? Yeah, it's it's a little different. I mean, I, there's wow. How is it different? It always begins with it at at the piano for me. It's like, like improvisation. That's the core of what I do. 
Um, and when I, whenever, when, no matter what the piece is, whether it's orchestra, whether it's opera, whether it's film, or for voice, I always start at the piano. And so when I get that into, you know, it, it, I improvise and get the ideas out, then it's sort of like, okay, let's think about the ensemble. And it's sort of like casting, if you will. You know, you're casting a movie, you know, you can hear, okay, this line is like, that belongs to an oboe, or this line belongs to a cello. You know, and I, I, you don't, based on the line, you don't mention that, mismatch mm -hmm. the, the ideas, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, that's, that's the same, essentially. Opera is a little different because you know you have collaborators. You know, have so many different, gosh, so many different moving parts. You know, and there's, then there's one thing that the other art forms that the opera doesn't have that have the opera does have, and that's feedback. Everybody has an opinion <laughs> <laughs> about what the music should be. Yeah, you know, the director has an opinion. Oh, this the music should be longer here. You know, and uh, or maybe let's take this up an octave. And the composer, yeah, you have to, you can take the feedback or be like, I don't think so, I don't think that works. <laughs> you know, so there's a hierarchy, you know, you can say, you can say no. But uh, I'm, in our, in, uh, when you're writing for the orchestra, you know, it's, there usually isn't, you know, feedback from orchestra members. Mm -hmm. but, but, okay, so let's consider your background, and I want to get uh, into that a, a little more. Um, but your back, I'd imagine your background, Carlos, you're more uh, familiar with with writing and with performing with a singer or a, mm -hmm. a smaller ensemble than writing for a large orchestra, right? So, is there a different learning curve when it comes to you know writing opera, or writing for a larger orchestra? I mean, something that you know, I'd imagine it's more difficult to get you know ten performances of a piece with a large orchestra, mm -hmm. and so you can adjust things sure, versus. Sure you know, working with Seth, where the two of you all can work sure, out things sure, together. Sure, well, That's why I went to school, you know, I wanted to learn how to develop technique. You know, I'd say my background in church, though, that, that allowed me to, you know, tap into emotion. And how to, and then when I got to school, you know, studied school, it, how do you put that emotion into actual written notes? So other, other people can translate that into the, into the performance side. You know, and so it was the foundation, I think, the technique that really helped me, you know, with, with, with everything. Mm -hmm. Carlos is going to head over to the piano and do something solo. Mm -hmm. This may be a song right. uh, that you all recognize. What, what's the tune, Carlos? Love is Stronger Than Pride by Sade. Yeah. It's an arrangement.
Pianist and composer Carlos Simon live here in the green space. Come on back, man. We're working on this friendship over here. You and me. <laughs> it's music by Sade. It's on Carlos's new record, Together. Let's talk a little bit about your background, Carlos. I, I mentioned that you, um, you grew up in Atlanta. Uh, you and I have a couple things in common. Uh, is that John Barbados jacket? Um, like me, you're a PK. You all know what a PK is? Anybody know? Pastor's kid. Yeah, pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I remember growing up in my father's house, mm -hmm. there were certain things that we couldn't do, you know, mm -hmm. listen to, watch on television. Yeah. It was very, you know, pretty strict about what we were able to sort of take in. Did you all have those? Oh, yeah, those for sure, lines? definitely. We, we can only listen to gospel music. Um, you know, certain clothes, we, especially my sister. My sister was here, she's way in the back there, uh, with the kids, but so like, I, they were more strict on her than she was you know, for me, but um, I, you know, we we couldn't listen to R and B or hip hop or, you know, anything with profanity. We couldn't certain movies we couldn't watch if it was rated R. Absolutely not, you know. Um, so it, it it was a strict household, and so I, I, you know, when I went to college, and I was like, okay, <laughs> let's 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 just open the floodgates here, you know, and and. As far as music is concerned, and so that's why I I, I, I put Sade on there on I wanted to because I that's one of the first songs I I you know heard and I was like wow that's that's so smooth you know it's like amazing and um, it has such a great message and that's why I wanted to to play it you know because I I've been listening to it a lot you know the last couple months and just kind of thinking about my my journey you know as a composer and, and as a person. Mm -hmm. So how did how did classical music come into your mm -hmm. life? Yeah, well, we every now and then they, my parents would put on the radio the, the classical music station, you know, coming from church, and I do remember hearing classical music, um, but we didn't we didn't grow up going to concerts. Yeah, you know, and then we and then growing up in Atlanta, we didn't have money to go to Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, um, but I knew the sound from. Hearing, hearing it in movies, you know, I'd, I'd hear Star Wars or Disney movies, and I'd be like, "Wow, that's that sound is amazing. What is that?" And so that's when I studied John Williams. I heard, I discovered John Williams, and um, I was watching a lot of Disney movies, Alan Menken, you know. And once I, it's like, okay, I, that that sound sounds very familiar. Okay, that it's the same orchestra, same sound as Beethoven, you know. So I studied Mozart and. These same type of um, techniques, the same type of uh, uh, ideas and sounds were happening in, in, in classical music. So I, I, just, I just follow the, the red trail, if you will. And of course, you know, studying, you know, spirituals and the spiritual arrangements in, in college um, and learning how to translate those ideas. I was learning in church and hearing spirituals and stuff like that into so actual written tone notation. You know, and that's one thing I learned in, during my undergrad at Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. Shout out, we're Morehouse graduates. I don't know if he was going to say that or not, but <laughs> I just made the you point. You stole my thunder. Man. <laughs> <laughs> this friendship is not going to work after. All. So, 2007, it was, I think, maybe October. I got a call from New York Public Radio talking about looking for a host for WNYC. And, um, you know, after a few conversations, I decided I was going to take a job here. At the time, I was teaching at Morehouse. And, um, and I had to go to campus and tell my students that I would be leaving the next semester. It was one of the hardest things I had to do because I really loved the work that I was doing, uh, working with these young men, uh, teaching applied piano, teaching music appreciation, taught theory for a while. And um, one of my students was a guy uh, whose name you may know, a uh, composer named Carlos Simon. 
and Carlos was always a challenge because <laughs> when he would sign up for his uh, applied piano lesson, he would want it so early. I'm like, man, are you sure you want? Are you sure you want this early lesson? I got to get up and I got to get over to campus. And Carlos wanted it early, and he was always on time, and he was always prepared. And um, and so for me to have him here some 15 years later is really an, is really an honor and it's really a, a testament to not only his you know, upbringing, but his work ethic, his sort of commitment to um, his upbringing and the things that he learned in his father's church um, to, the, to the person he's become. You know, whenever I hear people talk about him, uh, you know, as a, as a composer around the country, it's always the same. You know, he's a, he's a pleasure to work with. He always has a smile. He's always on time. He gets his work done. It's the same habits um, that he has as a professional that he had as a student. And um, hey, I think this friendship is going to work, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What y'all think? <laughs> and I, I tried to find a way to give him a B to like encourage him to like work a little harder, but I I couldn't do it. I think he um, for every semester he was in my course he was a straight-A student and that was not just in my course that was in theory and whatever he did uh, in our music department um, we're very proud of of the work that you're doing you know, on behalf of the college I can say that Thank you. let's give a hand to this to this young man. <laughs> now we're gonna hear a, a song um, that many of us know most of us, I would venture to say most of us know this song. We, although we may not know the background of this song. Uh, the song is Amazing Grace. It's known as an American spiritual. Um, it came out of a, you know, a, a very difficult time in our history uh, during the slave heist. And um, John Newton, who was a, a slave trader, he heard these African men humming a tune. Hmm. And he took that tune and he put words to it. And we're going to hear that tune now that Carlos has arranged for piano and cello. I won't bother to tell you the name of the tune, but we're going to hear it. And you can just sing the words in your, in your private space and think about the story of John Newton. And this tune is that a good enough setup for Carlos? Anything else you want to say? Yeah, you got it, man. Yeah. yeah. See, he still respects his professor. <laughs> My man. All right, brother. <laughs> Please welcome Seth Parker Woods, cellist, <laughs> Carlos Simon, arrangement.
Seth Parker Woods, Carlos Simon, Amazing Grace, Friday Night in the Green Space. Seth, talk about your um, connection to that song. Um, uh, well, I'm from Houston, Texas. Um, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church. My dad was a deacon. Um, so hearing that song pretty much every Sunday. Uh, so it's like deep <laughs> in my DNA in a way. So, but, all, but the way in which Carlos treats this, uh, this work is actually quite special. And um, it's fresh, I think, in a way that it's so rooted for me in a specific way. Um, so it's been really quite nice to jump in on this work, yeah. yeah. Uh, does your uh, connection to Carlos go through Chicago? No, uh, I, I well, no, um, I actually uh, met Carlos. Oh, he's over there. Um, I met him. Uh, I think I think this was two thousand seven. Um, I had come back to New York to study with the late Frederick Slotkin, who was with the New York City Ballet for many many years. Um, and I got a call. Um, I think it may have been in January, and the soprano Karen Parks um, was giving a recital at um, Weill. And um, she said that there were these, um, these spirituals that had been arranged by this young composer, Carlos Simon. I didn't know him. Uh, but then I met him the day of, and we went through the work. Uh, so that was actually my first time. And then I didn't see him again until just a few years ago. So, but it's been amazing, in person, I should say. So it's been amazing to kind of watch his star truly rise, yeah, yeah after all these years, yeah. yeah. Did you hear all that stuff I was saying about him backstage? I did, I yeah. Did. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank man. you. Thank you. <laughs> the next piece we're going to hear is a, hey, Jazz. This is Jazz OG. She works on our podcast, Every Voice, uh, with Terrence McNett. If you haven't heard that podcast, give it a listen. The next piece we're going to hear is a piece called Memory of Summer. Uh, it's only September 8th, so we're not of, out of summer yet, but you can tell us what you had in mind when you wrote that. Um, now, you talked about earlier that a lot of your music grows out of improvisation, or it grows out of, like, at the piano first. Um, you want to talk about uh, the inspiration for, oh, you got your own mic. Prepare. I told you he was always prepared. <laughs> Yeah, memory of memory of summer, Carlos. Yeah, memory of summer. It's it's um, basically improvisation, and you know, one of my favorite times of the year is summer. You know, going to the beach, being by a body of water, and, and of course, you know, the weather in certain places. Um, I I you know, so I I got into the studio to the studio, and I said, let me, I just want to improvise something, and. Um, this is what I kind of came up with, you know, in memory of summer, thinking about water, thinking about you know, iced tea. The um, I live in the DMV and uh, DC, and one of the things that that's, that's summer is like crabs, blue crabs, and I love blue crabs, and that's one that's one thing I was thinking about when I was improvising, and um, yeah, this is the idea of summer, you know. Okay, let's hear it.
have you in the green space on a Friday evening with pianist, composer Carlos Simon. Carlos, you do it your way, man. And I think that's what's beautiful about, about uh, the work that you're doing. You're, you are your full self in your art form, and it's, um, it's just uh, wonderful to see. Earlier I talked about this idea of um, something actually that NPR talks about is your knack for or your interest in social justice. We're here talking about your record together, but you also finished up an orchestral recording uh, for the Minnesota Orchestra, a piece called Breath that was released in September. Now, this music was written in response to the murder of George Floyd. Um, you've got some a spoken libretto. Mark uh, uh, Bamuti Joseph mm -hmm. uh, wrote the, the text. Tell us about, you know, what led you to, to want to deal with that topic, um, how it's been uh, taking that work to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. um, just tell us about that whole experience. Sure. sure, well in 2014 I wrote a piece called Elegy um, for Trayvon Martin. And um, you know at that time it seemed like it's every day it's a black person was being murdered by the police. You know, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner. And I'd written this piece um, as because I was feeling all kinds of ways. You know, I was afraid because it could have been me, uh, could have been any of my family members. Uh, I was confused. I was angry. And so, you know, I wrote this piece, Elegy, in 2014, just to kind of deal with these emotions. And, you know, when I got the call from the Minnesota Orchestra in 2020, at the end of 2020, that they wanted to commission me to write a piece for George Floyd, I almost said no, uh, just because I knew what it took to write that small work, and that was only five minutes long, and they wanted a 30-minute piece for choir and orchestra. And um, having gone through the process of like grieving and, and like trying to understand what happened and trying to put that in the music, it, I just knew it would take a lot of uh, emotional density. So, you know, I talked to my collaborator, you know, Mark Bamucci Joseph, and we were working on another project at the time. And, you know, he's also the vice president of social impact at the Kennedy Center. And so he, he's, you know, he said to me, you know, Carlos, I think we can do something different here. I think we can have something new to say other than focusing on the moment and the tragedy and the horrific uh, event, even though that's, it, it's important to talk about in the piece. But let's talk about what happens in the future. And um, what, what can we do collectively to make sure um, that we are creating anti-racist uh, anti -racist system, you know, and putting that into the music. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I said yes to the Minnesota Orchestra and, and writing this piece. Um, because, you know, it's, it's a collective duty that we all have in creating the system of, of equity. Uh, for everyone, everyone, and just you know, creating a, a, it's a, a one of the last lines in the in the piece is you know, so much work has been done, but who does the work that's still left? And we wanted to leave the audience with that mm. um, that call to action. Is that it wasn't just listening to the music or experiencing you know what what happened, but it was important for for folks to leave with something that they needed to do on their own. Is that um, that work undone that you're talking about? Like, where do we just start as individuals? You know, how do we mm -hmm. how do we embrace that? Like, when we call, walk out of this space tonight, you know, are there interactions that we have or things that we do um, where we can make different decisions? Um, what what did what did you all come up with? What what do you, is suggested in the piece, how do we proactively do this work? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, it's one thing is acknowledging the past, you know, the history. There's a lot of people who refuse to accept the history, um, and that's one thing. Uh, but also, once you realize the past and what, what happened, it, it's impossible for you to see how that's linked to what's happening today. 
In other words, you can't, you can't look at slavery and say, oh, it, it happened in the past. No, there are systems in place that come out of slavery and that they still exist today. And, and once you see that, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I know there's a bias that I have, uh, notice a bias that I have when I see a black man in, in a hoodie walking down the street at night. You know, that you notice that, you know, and, and that's just me as a black man. And so I, I can't imagine what, what happens when you know, other races, and, and so this is, this is something, the work needs to be done about the for like history, understanding one, history of American culture. Yeah, and it's something that we're trying to <laughs> get rid of, uh, oddly enough, yeah. we're yeah. trying to, yeah. And I think that's where music and, and your work is so important. Sure. Filling in those gaps. Sure, sure, um, sure. How, how was the work received by that orchestra, by the chorus? Do you, did you see any, any like any growth or any like aha moments or w what did you notice? Well, I mean, it's impossible to, to tell, but I, 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 I just got nothing but praise, you know, from, from the orchestras. I think one of the, the biggest compliment that, that Bamuthi and I re received was that, you know, you listened. You know, we, we spent two years going back and forth to the Twin Cities, talking with, you know, the community and, and, and 38th in Chicago where George Floyd was murdered, talking to his family, we talked to orchestra members, we talked to local artists, and we, we spent so much time talking to folks before we even wrote a note. And you know, to hear someone say, who, who's in the audience and, and, in, and even in the orchestra say, you all listened, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then, so that, that was a huge compliment. Yeah. So go check out the album, Breath. Yeah, it's called Breath. Now, in 2022, man, you've been busy. Goodness, 2022, you released uh, Requiem for the Enslaved. Wow, what a piece. It's a piece that honors 272 folk who were bought and sold by the Maryland province of the Jesuits to build Georgetown University. Now, when you came across this information, I think you were associated with Georgetown. Were you working at Georgetown? I had just gotten a professorship there in 2019. Okay. And um, you were poking around in the library. Well, yeah. I mean, that, 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 there was an article that came out by the New York Times um, about the history, yeah. and of course, the university had to do its due diligence and and coming forth with all the, the resources. Luckily, I mean, this school is, is steeped in history. And um, you know, one of the things I had to, or one I wanted to do as a new professor was like I understand the school's history, um, the culture, and they have all the stuff archived. You know, the actual bill of sale. You know, naming every single individual, how much they paid for them, and on that same list is with like barley or an, another commodity. You know, that they sold in conjunction with these with these people. Um, so, you know, it was, it, it was you know, the, the founders of the university were, were Jesuits. Um, they owned slaves with, with in, enslaved people in, 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 in the province of, of Maryland. They sold them to the slave owners in uh, Maringouin, Louisiana. And so I actually made a trip to Maringouin, too, and, and talked to many of the descendants there um, and wrote the piece after that. And everything shut down in March 2020. And I wrote the piece during that time. So a piece like Summer is, you know, necessary to keep keep some balance, yeah, man. man. Keep, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all the work you're doing. Thank you, sir. Um, you know, and this isn't in my notes. Uh, I haven't read this anywhere, but it's very apparent that you're addressing your heritage, your upbringing, and you're bringing that um, into concert halls, you bringing it into the green space. So we're gonna we're gonna try something right now. This isn't in my notes, but Carlos grew up uh, playing in church, Pentecostal church. I had a Pentecostal church job as well. Hmm. I had a Baptist church job and a Lutheran church job, and and in a lot of uh, black churches, you have to be able to use your ear because somebody might just start singing. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and if you're the church pianist, church organist, you got to be able to find where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember coming home from church sometimes, you know, I was maybe 14, and my mother would say, what took you so long to find out where she was? <laughs> you act like you didn't know that song. Right, right, right. Go in there and practice it right now. Right. Play it on the black keys. Uh -huh. She would, you know, because she's singing in a strange key. Ma, I can't play in that key. I don't know. So Carlos, go over to the piano because we're about to do this song. Janae Bridges is going to come out here and sing this uh, arrangement uh, that Carlos has put together. But I remember my grandfather used to sing this song at church. And he would sing it real slow. And uh, he was a deacon, and he would start off. And uh, sometimes he would, like, um, call out the words, and then the congregation would sing it. Uh, they didn't, oftentimes didn't use a hymn book. And he would say something like, Jesus, keep me near the cross there fresh precious fountain free to all Please welcome Janae Bridges to sing Near the Cross, arranged by Carlos Simon. We're live here in the green space on a Friday night. <laughs> now this is what um, was done with black composers who were that first class to come out of slavery. I'm thinking of Harry T. Burley, who worked here in New York. His grandfather would teach him these songs he learned on the plantation, and Burley went to school at the National Conservatory, studied with Dvorak, and he learned the, the craft of writing those spiritual songs and contextualizing them for the concert hall. And Carlos is in that tradition. So this is Near the Cross. Thank you. 
So my grandfather would say, so this is uh, our sister Janae Bridges. <laughs> and when she sings down at the, with the New York Philharmonic, we gotta go down there and support her. <laughs> and when she sings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art next February, we're going to go down there and support her. And, t and Janae, um, tell us what else you got going on uh, mm -hmm. over the next few months that you're really looking forward to so we can support that as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so happy to be here. Immediately after tonight, I'm going to Houston, actually, to premiere a new opera by Jake Heggie called Intelligence. So I'm very excited about that, um, just returning to developing a character with no preconceived notions or anything. It's, it's a, really, um, a really inspiring experience. And then I'll be back in New York to sing um, Stabat Mater by Julia Perry. Um, and, well, I won't talk about Julia Perry, but <laughs> I'm really excited to delve into uh, the work of this incredible black woman who has um, not been recognized enough. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And then the Metropolitan Museum with you and amazing colleagues, and then the Metropolitan Opera in the spring for El Nino by John Adams. So a lot of New York coming up. Now the first time I actually got to hear you sing was in a church up in Harlem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, so what does it mean for you to um, to be able to do this, to, to be able to work with Carlos and do these kind of songs that, you know, those of us who grew up in church mm -hmm. would hear these songs um, mm. perform sometimes spontaneously. Uh, what does it mean to have this sort of uh, composer arranging these things and you participate? Oh, it's um, such a luxury. Um, and it, it also feels like I'm home in a way. Um, Carlos and I have similar upbringings in that we grew up in the church. I grew up in the denomination AME, African Methodist Episcopal, representing. Um, <laughs> so we sang a lot of hymns, actually, and every verse, all six verses, AME's <laughs> love to sing the verses. Um, so when Carlos asked me to collaborate with him um, on Together and sing a hymn, I thought, wow, this is really bringing it home, you know? And we went into the studio and it just, it just flowed. So it's, it's nice to have um, a living composer who not only understands the voice, it's not always the case, <laughs> but also understands um, where he comes from and where I come from and how to translate that in, into music. And it really feels just like our spirits are, are flowing, you know? Um, so I'm grateful. To Carlos, thank you. <laughs> and uh, hopefully there will be many more spirit-filled collaborations. Thanks for joining us. Janae Bridges, <laughs> mezzo-soprano. We're going to bring uh, Seth Parker Woods back out. Um, he's going to play a piece uh, called Between Worlds. Carlos, this is uh, another one of your compositions. This is one is for solo cello. How, how much of that have you done? Well, at that time, not, not much, honestly. Not, not a whole lot of it. Um, Between Worlds, it's, yeah, it's, it's um, well, I'll just say this, it's hard writing for a solo instrument because you know, don't have anything accompanying or it's, in the cello, it's, it's, it's single voice line and for the yeah. most part. He's, he's playing some, some um some double stops there some, some some multiple notes but it's it's hard to write for solo instruments. Mm -hmm. Did you have Seth in mind when you wrote this or did you write it for? I did not wrote it just for the a competition, a oh. string competition and uh, the idea was they asked me to write a set of string pieces uh with the same difficulty and I ignored it completely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and you'll see this the cello part and it's I really wanted to focus on why I was writing the piece which is for you know, inspired by a visual artist um, uh, named uh, Bill Trailer, mm. and uh, he was he was born enslaved, um, but he died in like 1953. So he lived to see so much of American history, and that you can really oh. feel it in the work. You know, as you see, 
and, and, and see his work, you see the stillness, you see, but also the anger, you see the, the struggle. Um, and um, that, with this particular movement, I, it was the first one I actually wrote uh, out of the set of four. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was looking at a picture of him and, and he's in his eyes, there's a stillness, there's a depth in his eyes. And it's the same kind of, it, it's amazing how it's translated in his art. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't checked out his Bill trailer, Check it out. It's amazing. Now, is this uh, on one of your one of your records? It's on together. Okay. Yeah. The okay. new album, right there. All right. It looks like that. <laughs> That's the cover right there. All right. It's beautiful. Thank you, sir. All right. Seth Parker Woods playing "Between Worlds" by Carlos Simon.
Between Worlds, music by Carlos Simon, played by Seth Parker Woods. You can hear it on repeat. The record is Together by Carlos Simon. He's in the studio here with us in the green space. And we're going to have one more piece before Carlos gets out of here. Carlos, I want you to, to, to introduce this piece by uh, telling us about your grandmother. So you're going to start this sentence by saying, my grandmother. I don't know about this. Man. Uh, I'm going to try. My grandmother um, meant the world to me. Um, she was one of the reasons why I, I pursued music um, as a profession, you know, and pursued classical music as a profession. And one of the traditions, she lived in D.C., but we lived in Atlanta, and she would come visit us all the time. And one of the first things she would ma have me do, she'd get a hymn book, and she'd say, Carlos, sit at the piano. And she'd call out hymns. 574, the greatest of yeah, our faith in What's your grandmother's name? <laughs> <laughs> Bertha Simon. Yeah. Uh, Bertha Simon. I call her name tonight. Uh, but she would, call, she would, for two hours straight, just call numbers uh, <laughs> and, and the hymns. And I, would, I, was, I got my sight reading chops you know, from reading these hymns. You know? um, so when she, you know, she, she suffered from dementia about three years ago, and she's making a slow transition. And when, you know, as she was really transitioning to death, and we she barely knew who I was or anyone, for that matter, I made it a point to record one of her favorite hymns, When He Calls Me, I Will Answer. And I recorded it for her, and had it. we played it for her as you know, she was transitioning in this hospital, um, just because of the words of the song mean so much. And she would always sing the song, When He Calls Me, I Will Answer, I'll Be Somewhere Working for My Lord. And so um, we played it for her, and she transitioned. And I, I wanted to include this on the record as a dedication to her. It's a traveling song. Traveling song by Carlos Simon, performed live here in the green space. <laughs>
traveling song by a composer who's going many places, Carlos Simon, live here in the green space. Thanks to Carlos and Janae Bridges. Come on out, Janae. Seth Parker Woods. A big thanks to our friends at DECA Classic, Green Space Team. Also thanks to Steinway and Spirio Piano. And a huge thanks to you all for your support of New York Public Radio, WQXR, WNYC, and the Green Space. I'm Terrence McKnight. See you on the radio. Good night, everybody.